Very excited to be here and share with you today a little bit about uh, Inspire, but most importantly, in Arby's case and what we've been doing uh, with the Internet of Things and Smart Kitchen, things that actually can put not just a little bit of extra money in your P&L, but bags of money, lots of money. And so excited about that. Before I get into that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in the restaurant industry, industry since I was 15 years old. You know, started off, uh, wanted to wanted name brand jeans and a decent pair of tennis shoes. So I got a job making minimum wage, washing dishes, bussing tables. Didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Worked through high school in the restaurant industry. Got out of high school, had some aspirations to go to college. Became an assistant manager in a restaurant, going to college, then dropped out of college. Next thing I knew, I was a store manager. Next thing I knew, I kind of fell in love with the industry. And I love the industry because you could take, there's so many different walks of life, right? In the, in the, in the restaurants, you work with a hourly team member that may be making a little extra money, uh, wanting to go to college, saving to go to college or pay for college, or you may be working with a kid that dropped out of school, doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. But you work with somebody with a strong work ethic that will learn a new skill, uh, that's teachable, coachable, and they can climb the ranks. And you know, I went on and ran multiple restaurants, and then of course uh, went and um, uh, eventually got into the corporate office, right? Last 19 years, I've worked for Arby's, uh, which is now become an Inspire Brands, and I'll talk a little bit about that. In the last eight of those years, I have been specking equipment. And so what I try to do a little differently with specking equipment, doing all the equipment innovation, is I try to bring a operations kind of point of view to equipment specking. You know, a lot of big companies, they, they spec equipment through their supply chain, or they might have somebody like myself that um, tests and does research and development, supports culinary and product development. But we look at equipment very differently at Arby's. We look at equipment that can truly innovate, that can bring down uh, lower operating costs with a little bit of capital improvement. We look at equipment that can enhance our employees' lives, our managers' lives. And equipment that not only just supports our menu, but in a way disrupts how we've been doing business every day around equipment and the way we cook our roast beef and things of that nature. And so we've had some pretty exciting platforms like rolling out low oil fryers to all of our uh, company restaurants, about 1,200 company restaurants, uh, with custom programming, what we, what we call arbitizing it, saving five, $6,000 a year per restaurant uh, in energy and oil savings. We you know, had this initiative where we saw uh, one of our number one customer complaints was cold curly fries. And we said, how can equipment team solve that? We designed a fry dump, that, a custom fry dump that we could improve the curly fries by more than 30 degrees. We've totally changed our cooking platform from the way we traditionally, for 50 years, have cooked roast beef in a restaurant to using a cook and hold platform that eliminates equipment, removes ovens out from underneath the hood, um, switches from cooking to holding, stretches out the cooking process, improves the yield significantly, but gives us a 67% energy efficiency on our cooking platform. And most cool, the coolest thing, is it's connected to the internet, to the cloud, so we have electronic HACCP. So we look at equipment like that, what can we do when our senior leadership team, our executive team says, hey, we have this initiative that we need to lower operating cost, or we need to grow sales X amount and margins by X amount. You know, a lot of operators will say, or a lot of people in the company will say, oh, that's marketing's job. Oh, that's operations job. That's product development, culinary's job. And our team in the, co in the equipment says, how can we do that? How can we help contribute to that goal? So before I get any further into my presentation, I want to introduce you to uh, my teammate here, Alex Wolf. Uh, I'm going to be presenting today. Alex is, uh, Alex is the, uh, as he said to a supplier earlier today in a meeting, He's the guy that does the work. <laughs> he's, the, uh, he's our Internet of Things techie guy. I'm not a super techie guy. Um, in fact, I don't, I'm not going to be up here pretending to be any kind of uh, expert on the Internet of Things. But what I can share with you is a real business case that Arby's has done and the enormous amount of benefits, both um, operationally as well as uh, money, uh, savings. And I can share that, and, and quite frankly, I think 
in, in my view, it's very industry leading in what we've done. So let me get into that. Let's kind of do a quick overview of what we're going to look, learn today. I wouldn't be a good brand ambassador. In fact, Inspire wouldn't want me to come here and talk to you guys if I didn't tell you something about Inspire. So I've got a, just a quick snapshot of what Inspire, who is Inspire. Then I'll talk a little bit about the Internet of Things results that Arby's has had for the business case. With any project or platform, we'll talk about the challenges. There's always lots of challenges. But because of those challenges, we're able to set some pretty good goals and objectives. We'll talk about our technology strategy, and then some of the challenges we have with that technology strategy. And then lastly, we'll talk about the solutions and how we implemented those solutions before we turn it over to Q&A. So let's get started. Who the hell is Inspire? Inspire is it's a restaurant company unlike any other, right? And so what do I mean by that? Inspire has a unique portfolio of complementary restaurants. We own five brands. Our goal is to get to about 10, 11 brands across all the different spectrums in the industry, right? Whether that's fast casual, um, quick serve, fast um, fine dining maybe, entertainment, pizza, chicken, all these different segments, right? And that's how Inspire wants to grow. We're a balance of, of franchise and company-owned restaurants. We like that balance. No, no desire to change that. And then we have these really, what really makes us unique is these shared services of excellence that we have, that we're creating. And so you take some of the things, for example, that Arby's has done with around equipment. Well, what about like if we're so much stronger than, say, some of the things that Sonic may have done around equipment or B-dubs? or Rusty Taco, or Jimmy John's. Wouldn't we like to share that across the other brands? And so a lot of big companies that are, have multiple brands, they run in silos, you know? Uh, fantastic companies, but completely different operating structures. A lot of folks don't talk to each other in any other shared services, right? In Inspire, we want all these shared services, as many of them if we can, to go across the brands, right? So right now our equipment team is currently expanding over to be able to take over the B-dubs and the Sonic and the Rusty Taco and whatever other brands that we own. Think of new technology. Think of uh, strategy, disciplines, right? Um, analytics, you know, they can all be shared across the brands, right? And so that's kind of our, our focus with the centers of excellence. We're investing in capabilities that can be leveraged across platforms. It would be difficult to do at Arby's alone or B-dubs alone, right? But across all these brands, we can do this. We're helping grand, uh, brands grow, our brands grow, by taking the long view approach, right? And then lastly, creating a purpose-driven organization that puts values first. Inspire's the fourth largest restaurant company in America uh, in growing, and uh, sixth in, in the world at over $14.5 billion, or right at $14.5 billion. We have about 11,000 restaurants, of which a little more than 2,000 are company-owned restaurants which I think makes us the largest owner-operator of company-owned restaurants, right? The purpose of Inspire is to ignite and nourish flavorful experiences. We do that by, creating our, by our vision of invigorating great brands and supercharging their long-term growth. We live by a set of behaviors that we challenge ourselves. I'm not gonna go through them. You can see them up there for sake of time but a set of behaviors that challenge ourselves and our everyday task and our goals. And if we're not living up to those behaviors, then we gotta relook at our goals, right? Some of the brands that we own, uh, Jimmy John's, uh, most recently acquired Jimmy John's uh, late last year, uh, a little over 2,000 restaurants. Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, about 1,700 or so uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, about half of those are company restaurants. Um, Sonic, about 3,600 restaurants, about 200 of those are corporate restaurants. And then Rusty Taco, really neat street taco concept, only about 50 locations, but a lot of uh, growth opportunity there. And then uh, lastly, but probably most importantly, where everything began with Inspires with Arby's. 3,600 restaurants, about $4 billion in sales, and nearly 1,200 company-owned restaurants. So let's get into the results. Let's talk about the Internet of Things. So energy management, Arby's um, kind of take you through the results of some of the key benefits, some of the financials, and, and just sort of the overall platform real quick. 
So utility bill savings, delivering simple payback, and an initial investment of a payback in less than 12 months, right around 12 months payback. This provided an infrastructure for our online software gateway and allowed us to expand further with other pieces of equipment. So we started with energy management. From there, we went on and we connected uh, equipment, starting with the ovens. Then we went to other key pieces of equipment, like our reach-ins and our coal wells. Quite frankly, any piece of equipment that cooks food, holds food, hot or cold, um, and then of course a few things outside of that. For example, even like a dishwasher. They can like, why would you connect a dishwasher to the internet? Well, in our uh, testing platform, or testing restaurants rather, one of the things we observed, our average restaurant was doing about 45 cycles a day um, in, in the dishwashers. And we had one restaurant that was doing about 90 cycles a day, the same volume. We couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. Why were they using the dishwasher twice as much? So we get into the restaurant and we're looking and we're finding out every time they drop a knife on the floor, they were so excited to have a dishwasher, they'd run it through the dishwasher. Well, they were using <laughs> double the amount of soap, double the amount of energy, double the amount of water, double the amount of sanitizer. We we're able to discover that through the internet, not to mention error codes and some of the other cool things that we could see through a dishwasher. Expand to reach in, I said that other pieces of equipment, reach ins and holding cabinets and things. Uh, integration. I'm sorry, integration uh, reduces the risk and the operating cost. We're able also to re remove a large um, amount of the admin burden for our managers and staff. Talk a little bit about the key benefits to the energy savings. Equipment today, we meter our equipment before we spec a new piece of equipment. So when we're looking at a new shake machine, we look at the previous shape model or the current model, and what we're proposing. And of course, we're looking at all the usual things like you know the maintenance and the serviceability and the reliability and of course, how the end product is, but we also meter it. Because we have sensors hooked up to um, uh, circuit breakers, we can find out how much energy that piece of equipment is using. And a couple years ago, for example, we spec'd a shake machine that uses 28% less energy, delivers the exact same product, right? We wouldn't have known that otherwise. Controls in place for our HVAC, and accountability with outlier reports. And let me talk to you a little bit about that, what that means. So um, back when, before when we started the Internet of Things project, um, and Arby's was trying to turn some things around, sales had taken off, we were doing some really good things around sales, but the, prof, the margins weren't quite where they needed to be. And we looked at opportunities of where we can grow our margins. And one of those things we looked at was utility costs. Utility costs were like crazy high for Arby's. If you're not aware, the restaurant industry uses about nine times more energy per square foot than other retail. Well, Arby's was even worse than that. So one of the things we knew we had to do, we had to invest in some new HVAC, some new rooftop units and things of that nature. That doesn't do any good if people aren't controlling them. We walk into a restaurant at nine o'clock in the morning in the middle of the summer, and as we pull up in the parking lot, the windows would be frosted, you know, with, with moisture from the air conditioner running all night long, right? And then it'd be, you know, it'd freeze up for lunch, <laughs> right? Or in the middle of the middle of the winter, you know, coming in at eight o'clock in the morning, it's 85 degrees in the kitchen for even turning the equipment on. It's like these, we got to get controls in place. There's programmable thermostats, but with manager turnover, with uh, the lockbox, with people busting them, changing the code, all this, it was too difficult. There was no accountability. We're we're just dependent on the store manager, and, and a lot of times their personal preferences, right? So we put in this HVAC system with controllable thermostats through the cloud that really from my iPhone, I can change any one restaurant's um, temperature, any of, any of our corporate restaurants. But most importantly, we put up these parameters and we racked and stacked our, our, our restaurant teams and, and had these outlier reports. We knew what the kilowatt cost was uh, or the, um, uh, the, yeah, the kilowatt cost or, and, or gas. Uh, situation. Anyways, we knew what that cost was, and we, if we saw a restaurant or a segment of restaurants using more energy through HVAC because they liked it two degrees colder or two degrees warmer in their restaurant, however the case went, we could, that, that came out on an out, outlier report, right? And we could say, hey, you're costing the district or the restaurants uh, X amount more dollars per year, 
right? So we're able to have this accountability. Of course, you start sending this out in the hierarchy form and rack and stack and folks, nobody wants to be at the bottom, right? So it really helped us move the dial for energy. And of course, and then we found labor savings, huge labor savings by removing work tasks and automating reports for our managers. Uh, no more clipboards and things of this nature. So let me talk a little bit about our cooking platform, for example. So our cooking whole platform requires a HACCP because we're cooking raw roast beef. Our managers would have to touch a clipboard 50, 60 times a day. So they had to record time and temperature every time they took a roast out of the walk-in box and stuck it in the, freeze, in the oven. And then when it came out of the oven, they had to record that, and then they had to record, put it in the holding cabinet. When it came out of the holding cabinet, it went onto the slicer, and they had to record all that. They were touching the clipboard 50, 60 times a day to cook a roast beef, right? Just the one task. We're able to connect that oven to the internet, add a couple additional probes to our, our pods, and all that became automated and emailed to the restaurant on a daily basis. If further, if you're not aware, all restaurants today are required to record time and temperature of the equipment throughout the day. About every four hours, they have to record temperature of the equipment. Anything that cooks holds food, right? By connecting our equipment to that, our managers don't have, longer have to do that. It's all automated, right? So some labor savings we're able to reduce out of the uh, restaurant. Improved food safety um, through um, archive record keeping versus paper. Set up alerts for temperature, uh, temperature parameters. Improve accuracy for, for our managers. Kind of talking about food safety for just a second. We'd have a situation where the health department would come in, mark a restaurant off for a temperature violation. I .e. let's take a walk-in box. So we call the restaurant, we'd say, our food safety team, call the restaurant and say, hey, fax us your temperature log so we could see what it said. And we'd see, you know, we have some really good operators out there. But there's also some that pencil whip or just don't do it, right? And so they'd have to fax us in this report. And then, you know, what we would see, we'd see either blank, they didn't fill it out. If they had, that means they didn't check the temperature. If they had, they might have called for service. Or it was pencil whip, it said it was 34 degrees. Well, the health department came in 15 minutes after you recorded the temperature. How did it go from, you know, uh, 34 to 45 degrees in 15 minutes? It doesn't even do that when you leave the door open that quickly, right? So with the inaccuracies of that kind of stuff, right, and the old way of doing things. We improved operations through restaurant efficiencies, allowing our managers to be able to focus on operations instead of these <clears throat> admin tasks, right? We also have a platform we're working on right now called in, basically in-moment in training. And I'll, I'll give you some examples and share about that in a moment. I've got a couple of slides on that. And then improved equipment performance. A good example of that is um, we have a cook and hold platform or a fryer or whatever the case may be. They call AutoSham and they say, hey, I need you to come out my cooking platform. My cook and hold is not operating correctly. Well, because of our partnership with our suppliers, We've allowed them to have access to only their equipment, so they can log into our site Sage platform, our cloud. They can see their equipment, none of their competitors, right? And they can troubleshoot it. And they could say, like, you look at the history, and they could see how the how the uh, equipment is performing. And they say, oh, you don't, the cooking hole is performing just just fine. You left the door cracked open. That's why it was telling you to discard the beef. Save a service call. Or in reverse, let's say that a heating element went out. Um, they would see that, and they could dispatch service and say, hey, bring a heating element with you, right? So we've been able to do that. So I'm uh, talking about the training materials for a second, training support. Like most restaurants, we have these training boards throughout our restaurant, right? Wall chart, job aids, shows folks how to make the, the sandwiches, shows them how to make the chicken salad. The problem with the boards and a lot of the older restaurants it's wall space is very limited. Where you hang these things sometimes aren't in the most ideal place because it's not where they're performing the task, but it's the room that you have on the wall, right? So there's that piece of it. Then when you make a change, which for us happens about every six weeks when we do an LTO, you've got to change. So you've got to reprint the material, ship it out to the restaurant, and then you've got to wait for it to get implemented in the restaurant. And while we have some really good operators, sometimes it takes a little while for them to get it implemented which means people are making the sandwiches wrong. So what we're working on, what we have in, in uh, several of our restaurants now and moving to this 
for our corporate restaurants. And all this stuff, when I say corporate restaurants, is available to our franchisees. It's just whether our corporate restaurants, we may mandate it or roll it out in them, right? Is we have these learning tablets, or excuse me, learning boards. And we're putting the learning boards right in place where the employees work on the equipment, excuse me, work on the production line. Or in the kitchen where the prep area is, there's a, a touch screen um, learning board there that shows them how to make the chicken salad. They can have dirty fingers. They can have, uh, when I say dirty fingers, I mean food on their fingers. They can, <laughs> they can wear, have gloves on, and, and it touches and it works. But what's really cool is that it's live data. We make a change today, and immediately gets uploaded. So we don't have to worry about the Im implementation piece, right? Okay, Pete, that's all great, but you told me about saving money. Talk to me a little bit about the money you were talking about. Well, the last several years, Arby's has saved over $40 million in energy savings, another $3 million, and that's just at the end of 2018. We haven't even looked at what 2019 was yet, right? This is to cook the same curly fries, to cook the same roast beef, no negative impact to the customer, but using the Internet of Things to understand our energy consumption. What about labor? Let's talk about labor. Try $43 million over a five-year period on labor savings. About $7,200 a restaurant if you don't have 1,200 restaurants. Alex is working on a project this year that we're going to roll out that's going to give us another $5.5 million in labor savings or another $4,500 per year. This isn't chump change. This is some serious money. 11, nearly $12,000 a year in labor savings on top of the energy savings using the Internet of Things, right? Reducing admin for the restaurants, right? Having this stuff automated. Arby's has been recognized by uh, several industry and outside of the industry for a lot of the cool stuff that they've done. I'll skip over that. Let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges we had before we started the Internet of Things. Challenge that many of you guys would recognize as well. And then, of course, some goals we set to overcome those challenges. One of them was uh, cash emer costly emergency and overtime equipment repairs. Incomplete or inac inaccurate restaurant data records, like in the example I gave with the health department. Inefficient equipment performance. We knew our energy consumption was bad. We didn't know how bad it was until we started metering it. We're like, holy moly, right? Equipment downtime and product lost. So we set some, um, set some key goals. First one being streamline our operating cost. Increase food safety awareness. Arby's has some really good food safety practices and policies in place. But we need to create more awareness and some accountability when we got off target with those. Improve equipment performance and reduce downtime. Reduce the staff admin burden. Managers are having to carry around too many clipboards. What can be automated? Ops checklist, right? HACCP, equipment tracking. So what was our strategy? Let's talk about our technology strategy. Start with energy management. HVAC controls you heard me talk about already. This will help streamline the operating costs while laying the foundation for the platform, the infrastructure for the platform, allowing us to expand to other things. A lot of our, my competitors in the restaurant industry are approaching the Internet of Things wrong. What they're doing is they're going after food safety, which is the most important thing, by the way. We want our customers to eat safe food and our employees, right? But the problem is if you haven't had an outbreak, it's hard to put an ROI on that. It's hard to go and ask for X amount of capital dollars to invest in the Internet of Things when you're kind of getting away with it today and maybe safe, maybe not, who knows. But no major outbreaks, it's hard to put a business case. But you put energy behind it. Energy pays for the platform. And then you can build off of it with the labor and then you'll get the food safety and the other benefits, right? So we put our infrastructure in place. Then we moved on to equipment after we had the platform. Once we put that infrastructure in place, and again, I told you we paid for that in, in about a year, a little less than a year. To add connectability to our existing and new equipment wasn't much more. 
once the structure was in place. And again, the year after your energy savings were paying for it. So we started with, um, we started with which equipment contributes the most to operating costs? Which has the largest impact on product quality or product risk? Which has the highest capex, requires the most amount of admin for our staff? We had a desire for one software platform to integrate data and collect data, right, across all the different equipment, pieces of equipment, as well as our energy platform. The problem with that is the few manufacturers that were doing smart kitchen or kitchen equipment that could talk, as they wanted to talk to their system, not our system, right, one system. And the problem with that is you take like a middle B, fantastic company, owns God knows how many brands of restaurant equipment or well-built or ITW. The problem with that is as great as those companies are, we're not going to buy only exclusive well-built or only exclusive ITW or middle B. It's just not practical. And at the same time, we can't have 10 different logins and clouds to support all this equipment and 10 different gateways. How is that going to be secure in our restaurant? So we needed a single point. And restaurant manufacturers weren't quite there yet. And we had in, in Arby's, I think we were the last to get internet right. In fact, we're still working on it. Wi-Fi in our restaurants. You know? And so we had very inadequate or non-existent Wi-Fi for our restaurants. Okay? And then the, the need for security. Maintaining daddy's data security standards, right? If you're not aware, a few years back when Target got hacked and all the credit card stuff, they did that through their HVAC system. It was connected to the internet. So we had to have something that was very secure to protect our customers and our employees and our brand. So our solution, what did we come up with? So we came up with a third party platform, Internet of Things company, for us, Powerhouse Dynamics using the SightSage platform. Now, this isn't a pitch on Powerhouse Dynamics. They didn't pay me to say that. There are a lot of good other uh, third-party companies out there that do similar work. I just think uh, Powerhouse probably does it better than most. We built this thing from the ground up. It was very custom to Arby's. It was even a little new to Powerhouse, some of the things we were asking them to do. We were able to have a gateway that was secure, PC1 compliant, which is the highest rating for network security, okay? One gateway that laid the infrastructure for our controls. Communicated, uh, it can, the thermostats communicated to the gateway and <clears throat> allow for our energy savings. Sensors that we actually put on the circuit breakers, right? So every one of our company restaurants, the HVAC system, the walk-in boxes and other key pieces of equipment are the energy pieces monitored. We don't do it in every single restaurant for every single piece of equipment. It doesn't make sense. It's repetitive information. But HVAC, because that's all about controls and some other key pieces of equipment, walk-in box and stuff like that. And then we have a handful of restaurants we, where we do have everything connected so that when we're, look, when we're doing equipment testing, there are test restaurants, and we want to see pre and then post spec what the energy difference is, it's part of the ROI. It's part of the requirement, part of the, uh, the standard for specking equipment, right? Um, and then, of course, the integration layer that allows us to connect all the different pieces of equipment. Again, we want a Charleston and a Bevere. We want a Henny Penny and a Frymaster, right? So one, one solution. And then the single software platform that integrates controls and the data for the equipment. Right? Talk about implementing all that. It wasn't easy. A high level of collaboration between us, Powerhouse Dynamics, and our OEM partners, our equipment manufacturers. We had to determine the most effective way to integrate existing equipment and new equipment, right? There were a handful, a very small amount of uh, equipment manufacturers that had equipment that could talk Wi-Fi, but only to their gateway, to their device, right? And so if they had that kind of smart technology, um, this is where Alex worked with them very closely at Powerhouse Dynamics, to get them to change their protocols, basically the language that communicated back and forth so it could talk to our gateway. 
But most manufacturers weren't able to do that. They didn't have the Wi-Fi uh, capabilities, right? And so we created this wireless module, we call an S-Pod. And what it does, this was custom made for Arby's, but it's available for others now, industry sharing, you want the industry to be better. So we didn't say it had to be only Arby's. Um, but this S-Pod, what we could do with these, we would ship these in bulk to the manufacturer, and we'd have the manufacturer, we'd have Charleston, we'd have Bevera, we'd have Penny Penny, put these on the equipment at the plant, and through a serial cable, would pull the data out of the controller. So whatever data was in their controller, we would get that data through that S-Pod. As soon as we put that piece of equipment in the restaurant, it would automatically connect to the gateway. No, no uh, installers, no infield installation. In fact, that was one of the requirements. We didn't want, we didn't want any text to have to come out and install um, sensors or um, S-Pods onto the equipment in the field, right? We're able to avoid that. So we have two ways of doing it. The S-Pod from the plant, but that's only good for new equipment. We've got a lot of restaurants and we've got a lot of existing equipment. We're not going to throw it all out. So Alex and the team were able to uh, work with a device called a, uh, a Y-Temp. And basically with a zip line, zip line, a zip tie, <laughs> they could put it in a rack in a reach-in cooler and it would take the temperature and the time of the walk-in box or whatever piece of equipment you put it in, um, and then um, it would send it over to the gateway. Two-year battery, the thing would you know, buzz us and, and notify us when the battery was getting weak, and you had like a month to change it. So um, completely you know, wireless, and probably a $50, $60 sensor. Pretty simple. Alex told me I wouldn't love to tell you guys price. <laughs> so in summary, if you're going to start an Internet of Things platform, start with a prioritized list of business challenges and objectives, right? Align those solutions with, with goals and objectives. Have an easy to qualify payback. Remember, food safety is important. It's the most important thing. But energy pays for it. Labor pays for it, right? More OEMs today are delivering equipment that connect and can talk. And I challenge you to keep challenging them or to challenge them if you're not, to, to establish a NAFM protocol. I like to say that a lot of the equipment manufacturers are going this direction. With a lot of the work and a lot of the push that we've had, Na, uh, Alex is on the NAFM protocol subcommittee. We're trying to get a standard set up in the industry. So if you have an oven for a Blodgett or a, a fryer from Henny Penny, they all speak the same language, right, and protocol. Could you imagine, think of, all, think of our home, right? You've got a Wi-Fi box in your house. It's connected to the Internet. And your phone, your TV, your computer, all these different devices connect to the Wi-Fi box, and you get Internet. Basically, what the equipment manufacturers are asking us to do is not do it that way, right? Only talk to their gateway. So imagine having 20 different Wi-Fi boxes in your house to talk to all your different devices. It's not, it's not practical. It's short-term thinking. So we've got to challenge the manufacturers. A lot of them are starting to open up to it. And then find a system that can integrate across, again, all the OEMs. That's all I have. We'll bring Alex up, and uh, Alex can answer any very technical questions for you if you want to go really deep. And. Uh, um, if you've got any questions about the platform, I can, I can answer those. Yes, Richard. Yeah, I just want to point out the NAPM data protocol was first created about 20 years ago. Hmm. And because of, you know, um, economy and fragmentation, it never actually got implemented. But if you guys all join Alex and say, we want this, mm -hmm. then you'll get it. Because that's how it started with all the major chains sitting in a room and saying, we want this. And then we agreed on what it should look like, and then everybody, there was like a dot-com bus, and everybody went off and did their own thing. We're tossing the uh, torch to you, Alex. You get to now take it the next 20 years. But it's there, and it's, it just needs to agree. We love the S-Pod, but we'd love to get, be able to get rid of that. You know, it's, it's been a workaround, and it's been successful for us. There's not been a single piece of equipment that we've not been able to connect, either through the S-Pod or the, the Y-Temp that we have. So, any 
Yes, sir. What's the acceptance of your uh, franchisees uh, to go to this platform? Yeah, uh, early on, um, they were like thinking we're crazy, you know, uh, very old school kind of mentality. But we have probably, what, um, at Arby's, what you say, Alex, over 100 franchisees? Yeah, over 100. So, which 80% of our franchise, excuse me, 20% of our franchisees make up 80% of our, our system, our restaurants. So, 100 franchisees, we only have 300 franchisees, so I'd say a third of the franchisee, all the big ones are catching on. And we keep adding to it and building off of it. Uh, one of the things Alex is working on is a shake probe that goes in the top of the hopper, and allows us not to have to break down the shake machine um, nightly like we do, and um, allows it to, to go all week long uh, and break it down once a week. That saves us at 45 minutes to an hour a day in labor, not having to break that thing down back and forth. And what's really cool too, anybody ever gone to a drive through machine? At nighttime, excuse me, a drive through and it's 10 o'clock, you got an urge for a shake, and I don't know, I'm not going to say what brand has happened to us to shake machines down. No, it's not. They broke it down early so they could clean, right? And go home, right? What well, tells us that they do that? <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, some of the cities are starting to talk about eliminating natural gas downstream and forcing at least housing, but even talking about restaurants too, yep. to eliminate natural gas. Yep. So have you guys had any research states. or experience going in that direction and is it realistic yet or not? Richard, do you want to take that question? Because I get my information about that from Richard. There is a session on this <laughs> tomorrow as well. Yeah, Jason, what time do I speak tomorrow? Yeah, come to, come to that one. It, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Berkeley was the first city to pass the ban. But I think what's happening is other cities, because we are raising the flag and saying what this is going to do is essentially hurt small businesses. And even though some of you are big multi-billion dollar corporations, you're essentially small businesses, each mm -hmm. one of your units and your franchisees yep. definitely are. So we're raising that alarm to municipalities and just letting them know that it's, that it's one thing to ban the gas into somebody's residence. It's a whole other thing to do it into an energy intensive factory, which is what your commercial kitchen is, mm -hmm. and then it drives up prices. So we have seen places where people have carved out, they'll, they'll do the ban for residents, but they're carving out for restaurants, and that's what we think is the best thing. But I won't give it all away. You can come tomorrow. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Anybody else? This yep. is a construction technical question. If, if you test each piece of equipment individually, at the electrical meter box, that means every piece of equipment has to have a dedicated circuit at the panel. Mm -hmm, that's Is true. that correct? Yep. And we do that. You do do that now? Yep. Yeah, we do that for uh, to protect the equipment. Uh, I mean, it's, it's good practice, 20 amp. I mean, there's a few that obviously go over that. But we want every piece of equipment to have its own dedicated circuit. So it's all labeled. We have a production table where most of our equipment sits. And um, that production table also has a circuit panel where every microwave, every the slicer, the toaster all have independent circuit breakers. So it makes it easy to track. So, yeah, you're right here. Uh, you what you're saying is on the COVID holes in particular. How much of that savings when you're looking at 60 plus percent is coming out of taking them out from the implants? None. We didn't even meter the hoods. That was just strictly. Our cook, our, the way our restaurants operate, we have three cook and hold pods and one CADCO convection oven, countertop convection oven. Um, and what's cool about that, we used to have a double stack uh, Garland or Blodgett oven. And, and obviously we still do in a lot of restaurants today, but in all of our company restaurants, every time we build a new restaurant or remodel a restaurant, we put the full platform. We have the cook and hold platform in every company restaurant, but we add to it. And um, when we metered three cook and hold ovens, and the one CADCO oven, which isn't running all day long, it cuts off when we're not using it. It like automatically cuts off when the, when the product is ready. Unlike the Blodgett ovens, it would run all day long, 14 hours a day, right? Three paws in the, in the CADCO use less energy than the one holding cabinet that we had to put our roast beef in when we took it out of the oven, not to mention the convection oven. Yeah, it was like a, over $2,000 energy savings. That was five years ago. It's significantly higher now.
So I see a few of our construction team in here for Inspire Brands. They're constantly challenging me about equipment prices. So now you know why. <laughs> I just made my case. Where's Paul Quinn? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Kryan and Thank Alex you. Wolf. Thank you.